And that is why my Patreon charges by the video and not by the month. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. Today I've come dressed as the Blue Power Ranger, apparently. We're doing some some D&D today. Nothing crazy, nothing huge. I always talk about vague and evocative, uh, and so maybe this will help you see how I place that on top of like some monsters, some some batty battens that uh, my players have to face in our D&D games. This one's not quite on the scale of like revamping ghosts, which I did before. It'll be in the corner. This time I'm talking about how I ran red caps in a recent game. Just because as I was prepping for the session, I realized that maybe some of the things I was doing would be things that uh, you find interesting, or maybe new DMs would find helpful. Who knows? At the core of everything, uh, I, I pick a beastie that I want to use, and I think about what, what the important thing for that monster is for me. For red caps, it's uh, that element that says red caps tend to live near battlefields uh, because they have to keep their hats soaked in fresh blood, and if the blood dries out, then they will die. There we go. It's already evocative, isn't it? Because we've got we've got a battlefield. We got wounded soldiers, we got creepy things crawling out of the woodworks, and they're gruesome by necessity. Now from what I understand, I think there are um, actually published red caps. They, uh, I think they're, they're grouped in with like the devils and stuff, maybe? I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they already exist within the D&D sphere. But you may have picked up by now that I hardly ever use uh, pre-written monster stat blocks. I take inspiration from them and then I do my own thing. See, at the moment, uh, I really want to kind of push home? Send home? Send home? Draw home? I want the players to fully be immersed in the idea that right now they're kind of in a, a, a battle zone area. It's not necessarily all battle all the time, but there are soldiers about, there are conflicts about, battles could spring up around them at any time is the mood that we're going for. And I figured that Red Caps would be a, a cool villain to drive that home. Drive it home? Is that it? I'm an English major. So I'm not super sure how to structure this video, but but from here I think I would like to talk about um, flavor versus crunch. Or not even necessarily versus, just um, how the two interact. I would say that a good chunk of uh, the combat -y stuff that I run is flavor forward. So in this case, I've had my party, they've had a whole session that's kind of uh, a little more hijinxy, a little more um, them doing silly things the whole time, setting a kind of a, a mood that was a little bit more um, lighthearted, not entirely lighthearted, mind. But you know, it was pretty, it was relatively standard fare for the most part. Until they're in this little frontier town, they notice that it's it's pretty heckin' empty. It's a seasonal mining sort of a setup, so they weren't expecting it to be over full, but it doesn't take them long to figure out that actually a battle had happened here recently, within probably a couple of days. And so there's a lot of uh, dead bodies around the place. And in particular, bandits have dragged a lot of the bodies into kind of the the town square, for lack of a better term, so that they can loot them all more efficiently in the one place. So I, I laid a little bit of a false lead, a little bit of a false lead in there, letting my players think that they were going to be battling the bandits. But then as the sun begins to set, darkness is beginning to fall, it's just at that time of day where you suddenly realize that you really need to start turning on lights. And one of the sort of small fry bandits who the players had worked out, his name was Dogfan, he starts getting really nervous. He starts, he keeps glancing into the west and looking back at their leader, this tiefling bandit, and saying, Mass, Massacre, we shouldn't have been here this long, we should have left hours ago. And the tiefling really doesn't want to leave the work behind, but even at that point, this this big burly tiefling, I described, I, I had my rogue recognize, role to recognize um, a tattoo, sort of a, a brand on this bandit that, that marked him as a member of the Choke Hill Jacks, so there was this element of this guy at least, the leader, is pretty serious. He's he's a tough dude. He's not he's not a pushover. But even he at this point starts to kind of waver and eventually the bandits decide to to book it and leave. And so my players start 
getting a little nervous. They're like, what's going on? Exactly why are they scared of the sun setting? Should we be leaving too? Should we be getting out of here? And I give them maybe like 30 seconds to talk this out and start freaking themselves out. Because once everyone starts talking and no one really knows anything, they're gonna waste enough time. For it to feel reasonable for me to then say, as the sun fully sinks over the horizon. I found my notes that I had written out. It says, as the streets turn dark and the square around you dims, the crows on the gathered bodies collectively take flight, leaving an eerie quiet in their wake. Except a handful of the blackbirds right near the center. They don't take off, don't even shift from the body that they stand on. But the body does. A small, lithe form, humanoid, you think, but so encrusted and caked in mud and grime and refuse and blood that it's barely distinguishable. For most of the players, your dark vision has already transitioned to casting the scene into a colorblind grayscale, but for Barb, in the fading sun, she can just make out the deep, bleeding red of the hat on its head. And it isn't alone. Others crawl from among the bodies and rise to look at you with beady, shining eyes roll for initiative. So suddenly the whole mood of the session shifts. It becomes this creepy weird thing where no one was sure what they were at first. A lot of my players are familiar with the idea of red caps, but at first the fact that they were hiding amongst the bodies, the fact that one of them is, is wearing stiff, probably dead birds as like ornaments, it kind of threw them a little bit. They were like, are these undead? Are these, what, what is happening here? Which is perfect. Ow, I just hit myself in the face. All right, now we get to the slightly more crunchy stuff. Those of you who like crunch are about to be severely disappointed. So, this is, this is how I wrote stuff up. I basically had um, three classes of red caps. I had some red cap archers, I had some red cap sneaks, as I called them, and I had one magic user red cap guy who was unclassified in class, but, uh, I, I called him the Red Cap Raven. He's the feller in the middle, wearing all the birds. Now I've mentioned this before, this is how, I'll have to draw one up on the computer so that you can see it properly. But how, I've talked about how I lay these things out before, it's just a scribbled little um, version of a monster stat block. Basically I have stuff that you need to know up top that isn't really categorized, so initiative, speed, and proficiency bonus efficiency bonus, followed by a defense section. You've got armor class, you've got hit points, you've got um, any saves that they are proficient in. I only put the number down for saves that they're proficient in. I feel like getting too into the nitty gritty of that is like, ah. Like if they're not good at strength saves, then why bother giving them any additional points to it? Like for a very big bad guy, sure. For someone like a red cap sneak that you're expecting to die in a couple of rounds, don't even worry about it. An offensive section where you get uh, any attacks they have and any special other things that you need to remember. So with this stuff in mind, okay, the way that I structured this battle specifically, but probably also most of the ones that I run, I'm thinking about what cool moments I can help to create. You know, set it up so my players can knock it down. I throw in just a couple of these as spicy little options. I tend to be all right at predicting the way that my players think. So Hylas, our monk, very excited that he can, uh, you know, catch projectiles. So I'm sticking some archers in there who are gonna, you know, take a shot at him. I know that Bob the Barbarian has a million hit points and likes showing off how many hit points she has. So I've built in a, a bunch of little sneaky guys that can gang up on her and give them sneak attack damage and she'll still be like, Aah! you get what I'm saying? You don't have to do tons of it. Your players are gonna come up with most of the coolest stuff on their own, but just having little pieces of the combat that highlight uh, one or two players per combat, I think is nice. I think it's fun. I think it's, you know? All right, so let's look at them a little bit more one by one, shall we? Red cap sneaks, as I said, uh, I gave them sneak attack damage. I described them as having, you know, rusty little like butcher's knives or daggers they'd stolen from soldiers' bodies. They don't do tons of damage, obviously, but when you get like three of them, all attacking your barbarian at one time, getting sneak attack damage. It doesn't matter how much damage you're actually doing. What matters is that that looks scary from the outside and it's gonna freak the rest of the party out a little bit. Bob is gonna survive that no sweat. I'm not looking to kill anyone this, this particular combat, am I? No, she's not gonna sweat it, but the others looking from the outside hearing, and this one has sneak attack damage for the second time, 
they're gonna be like, oh no, we have to save Bob. There are a couple more things to be said about uh, the sneaky sneaks, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The red cap arches. The purpose of the arches was to have them in kind of an out of reach position so that my ranged able characters would be more likely to be the ones to go after them. So while your big heavy hitters are down on the ground, like swinging through the little guys crawling about their feet, your ranged peeps can kind of have their own thing going on elsewhere. There's actually not a ton to say about them. No, you know what I will say about them? While these other bad guys, while these other red caps are crawling up from the mounds of bodies and from like wells and stuff, having a couple show up on buildings around behind the group or around the edges gives the impression that this is a much larger group of bad guys than it necessarily is. Because it feels like it's surrounding them, right? Now the archers and the sneaks, very specifically, so I mentioned there were quite a few of them, right? The two very important things about this, I did write down hit points for them. Some of you are gonna hate what I say next. I did not strictly follow the hit points. It's, it's very much like the minion rules, but not. Basically, I also write down, so I, I'll say, what, what did I give them? I said, um, the archers have eight hit points, the sneaks had 10. But next to those, I wrote a little note. I wrote down that the, the sneaks should survive approximately two hits, the archer should go down on a second hit. The reason I did this, and, and I didn't even follow that strictly, right? Okay, hear me out. Being able to um, pay attention to the flow of the battle, I think is more important for constructing an enjoyable experience than actually strictly following a hit point total. And hit point totals, especially like if you're getting them from the monster manual, if you're just making them up, sure, you can, you can do a lot of uh, numbers work, work out like the averages of how much damage your players do, work out how many rounds you want things to survive, kind of average things out, work out damage output. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do there and I've spent, I've done that a lot. I think it's useful. I think it's helpful stuff to work out. Um, but at least if you're like me and you're not especially skilled at, uh, at, at adding things up on the fly or subtracting things on the fly, it takes away from your ability to pay attention to where the battle is getting boring, whether the battle is going faster or slower than you wanted it to. I think it is far easier to just say, if this red cap gets hit a third time, he's dead. That way you only have to think about AC. It's during the other player's turn, they roll to attack that guy and you're like, what's his AC? His AC is 12. They hit a 12 AC, great, he got hit. If they roll especially low on damage, maybe let the sneak live a little longer. If they roll especially high on damage, have the sneak live shorter. It's that easy. I know that it takes away some of the crunch and a lot of people love crunch, but if you're a little crunch averse or you're, um, you know, not especially qualified to crunch, like me, consider this as an alternative. So that's a potentially controversial tip that people might not like, but I'm just saying, ran it, it worked well. <laughs> the other thing is, um, because I was having a lot of bad guys, I mostly just had um, something like four bad guys come out at first. I was like, there are four bad guys. And I knew that more would add to the battle, um, but I kept how many in reserve until I could properly see how well people were rolling, how, you know, you know, sometimes you're like, you do all the maths and then people are just not hitting anything. The archers could not be hit. So we only ended up with two archers for the whole of the battle compared to the sneaks who were getting hit all the time. And so I ended up throwing like all of the sneaky red caps at them, you know? And staggering those to be kind of like wave combat in a video game or something, it means that uh, I was able to keep that impression, that impression that there are a lot of these things. It's like an infestation almost, right? But having said that, not literally overwhelming the players. Now, let's talk about the red cap raven. This guy, he's like a mound of feathers and mud and blood. He has at various times caught these birds that are feeding on the carrion. He's killed them, he's stuffed them, and he's attached them to his outfit. <laughs> outfit? Seems like the wrong word. It's couture. This guy does have hit points. You know why? Because he's the, the biggin for this particular battle. You're biggin, hit points are a go. And you know what? If you do it this way, 
you only have to focus on the hit points of this one important baddie. Now none of my players uh, knew exactly what this raven guy could do, so just to really make it clear, he's a magic user, and he's dangerous, and he's the biggest baddie on the field, as if, you know, the raven ornaments didn't already do that. When his first attack came around, which pretty sure was fairly low on the initiative order, it's the raven's turn, and one of his ravens starts to move, and it takes flight. It is not a dead raven ornament. No, no, no! It's his familiar. This guy, we're dealing with ideas of like infection and um, gruesomeness and like the vibe we're going for is like it's sharp and it's grimy. So the first spell that I give this red cap raven, of course it was inflict wounds. And he casts it through his raven so it flies out and whew, swoops past and like scratches the, the cleric of the party in the face. And as soon as my players hear me say, and that's 3d10 necrotic damage, they're all like, oh no, oh no! It's very dramatic. I was really pleased with how that went. And I really only had to do that once to, to send the message, this is a big bad guy. I think he only uh, hit like one or two other people with spells throughout the rest of the battle. Uh, because actually one of his turns I had him cast Darkness instead. The reason I did that was because I wanted to um, play with this idea. They're already fighting in dim conditions. It's not affecting most of them. Uh, it's, it's affecting the Barbarian, who's human, but everyone else has dark vision and can see well enough in the zone that they're fighting in that it's not really causing a problem. But then this this guy like picks up the helmet of one of the dead soldiers and casts darkness on it. And this huge sort of circle of supernatural pitch encircles them. And so one of our players, our bard, has to cast uh, light. And it becomes this weird thing of magical light and magical darkness uh, sort of pushing in against each other. And in the magical light, you get these sweeping shots where some of these people with dark vision who've just been seeing in grayscale the whole time, suddenly they can see all of this red flashing up as these things are fighting. Having my players screaming, as soon as I put down these things that said uh, red cap on them, having my players start shouting, Dale, you made red caps so disturbing. How did you make them the worst things ever? This is horrible. That's it. That's, that's, the dream. That's what a DM lives for. So I don't know, for me there are bits of crunch, uh, but it's watered down crunch and then it's wrapped all up in, uh, in a bevy of flavors. Maybe I should have named this video How to Run Combat with Flavor instead of Numbers. I don't know if this was useful to you. I hope it was. Somewhere out there, someone found something useful in this conversation. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. Cool cats. I don't know how I feel about this choice.